Hey yo, what is going on everybody? Today I decided to do something a little bit different, something that I had in mind for quite a while by now, and that thing is an anime review. An anime episodic type review where I share my thoughts about the anime, share my thoughts about each episode and uh, see what I like and what I what I don't like. And the anime that I decided to work on is uh, Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. I've heard good stuff about this. I've heard that it is quite uh, wholesome. Like I've seen clips of this show. I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, <laughs> the characters that are in it, but I never really, um, I never really sit down and uh, uh, watch the entirety of it. So I'm just gonna be doing that like right now for for this video for you guys. So let me know if you enjoyed uh, Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. Let me know if you enjoyed this video. And if you want to see more of this stuff. So, yeah, with that being said, let's see what this is going to be about. What the hell? I love that the way this first meeting is portrayed is similar to that of a one night stand with someone, like all drunk. And the person may think it was just for one night stand, but the other person, however, saw it as more than that. Like, like, they developed a deep connection. But the difference is you have like a master and mate now. Toru does display affection for Kobayashi in that way too, it seems. She finds Kobayashi cute, licks her clothes, and even gets jealous at Takia, Kobayashi's co-worker. You thought that the dragon maid was the only weird one? <laughs> Kobayashi being drunk and stripping Toru naked in public definitely takes the cake. Man, I really should start drinking more. I have definitely been underestimating the alcohol. If I can get my own cute dragon maid like this and get tons of fan service. Lots of booba. I definitely cannot complain about that one. And Toto is cute. Like, ultra cute. On a scale from 1 to 10 in terms of cuteness, I'll give her a 9. It'll be very hard to top her. Ah, great. The scale already exploded this early on. I mean, god damn, Kana is precious. Like, I've seen some clips of her on the internet before I started watching this show. Like, I knew the existence of this character, but Christ. I feel like I, if, if I look at her too much, I might develop glycemia after this. Also, where the hell is this animation coming from? Who could have expected that Kana can use Kamehameha and Toru can go all four tail QB on her ass? You tell me that this doesn't look like the devastated village of Konoha after the pain arc. Okay, this is relatable as fuck. It was indeed heartwarming when Kobayashi let Kana stay with them, since she has nowhere else to go. And the bit at the end with Toru being grateful to Kobayashi for helping her, like after escaping death. That was really sweet. Viewers, it is time for you to decide. Kana? Hakase from Nichijo or Anya from Spy Family? Leave a comment below letting me know who you are gonna choose. Obligatory fan service bathroom washing scene? Check. Double check. This was a fun episode. Kobayashi decides to move to a bigger house since the previous one was too small for all three of them to live in. Lots of fun shenanigans while they are moving out, including the neighbors being all noisy and having to solve that. Which leads to this moment of Kobayashi saying that she ain't as bothered about the noise, cause, well, at least it beats the hell out of all the quietness that she had before. Which definitely hints towards her loneliness prior to Toru coming into her life. <coughs> Sorry, it seems that I was suffocating there because of too much cuteness after seeing Kana try to find a place to sleep. Mm mm, half near. Wouldn't mind if you ended me. Uh, I mean, what? And here comes the fake one, Lukoa. Boy, you're telling us that Toru is a D for a dragon? <laughs> well, Lukoa is an H for Honka Burgers. She will be the winner every time at pillow fights. I recommend Twin Peaks. It is definitely a must watch. The Hindenburg was destroyed in 1937, but now we got two more, so it's not a big deal. A version of Patty Cakes I would definitely play. Kana is going to school! So wholesome. 
Some of my favorite moments in this include Kana realizing Kobayashi may have a bit of a hard time with the money spent on all the stationery, thus putting back the blue little bunny keychain. Also, this moment of Kobayashi telling both of them how it is for the best if people don't stand out much, which is a much more severe case in Japan for decades now. So Kana shows concern and feels sorry for Kobayashi if something bad is gonna happen because of the dragon shenanigans. And Kana herself more than likely being scared too if things are not gonna go as peachy as she wanted. Which leads to Kobayashi reassuring her that everything will be fine. Oh, and also this moment of Kana learning to write, and her first words are stuff like money, fortune, boyfriend, you know, that, that sort of stuff which would ease Kobayashi financially. Excuse me for a moment while I jump out the window because of too much wholesomeness. And thus begin the school shenanigans. <laughs> we also get introduced to the official five head number one Kana Senpo the cast. Pretty cool. And uh, she is quite an oddball sometimes. The dodgeball duel was fun. Definitely one sided, for sure. Front sided, that is. Am I right, boys? Hey! Toru decides to visit Kobayashi at work. And when I say visit, I mean basically spy with her blocked perception magic to learn more about her. And a big important thing with this is Kobayashi's reflection on how she is now and how she was like two months prior. We also have like a Fafnir focus part here where Toru helps him find a place, which leads to Fafnir questioning Toru about living in the human world, and that Kobayashi will eventually die while Toru still lives afterwards. Toru doesn't want to have like any regrets, as she wants to treasure the feelings she has right now while Kobayashi is still alive. Also, this moment does paint Fafnir as someone who questions Toru's views when it comes to her being involved with the human world, and that he himself would never be able to understand it or want to live with humans, but uh, scratch that. I think that he does just fine since he had an interest in living with Takia to begin with <laughs> and played games together. And last but not least, what I consider my favorite part of this episode and maybe even my favorite part thus far? It is this bit at the end where Toru and Kana train themselves in comedic fashion to do the spoon bending trick, with Kobayashi understanding that Toru wants to understand humans, which is more than likely linked to Toru wanting to understand Kobayashi since she probably thinks he will help her, that by acquiring new knowledge and power only then she can help Kobayashi plenty. Thus, Kobayashi shows her how the spoon trick is done. And that while there are some things easy to understand, some things are not. And that it is best for Toru to focus on what she can do herself already, since that has helped Kobayashi plenty as is. I feel like there is more to this scene as well, but as is, this has been my favorite thus far. We are crossing some dangerous territory here, show. Yeah, bye! <laughs> what are you doing? How come my magic rituals don't end up like this? You know, Lukua living with this Shota boy really feels like a separate anime that is happening at the same time with Kobayashi and Toru. It could very well be a spin-off. An older woman whose body is an agitator of lust, who stays home with this little boy and- What is this episode doing? Fafnir, help me! Oddly enough, that is the most normal thing that I've seen today. Alright, well this part right over here is wholesome. Fafnir is having a nice friendship with Takia now, playing games and having Fafnir addicted to them day in and day out. He comments that humans are either hit or miss, and it is easy to find miss, while hits are more difficult to find. In the end, apparently he found a hit with Takia, which is nice. Ah, the beach episode! Yay. Of course they were gonna do one of these. However, they sorta of tricked us, you know, they sorta of tricked us. You see, this isn't just a beach episode, it is an episode about family. Kobayashi tells Toru her situation with her family, her basically having a normal life, then leaving home to work. Which is basically what Toru did as well, by leaving her own road to come here and be with Kobayashi. With Toru, it is a little bit diff more difficult since dragons in her own world, including her parents, they don't favor humans, and she's basically the one dragon that is different from the rest of them, one who views humans differently, who is independent and has her own set of values, which is nice. 
Though, I guess now we can also include Kana, Fafnir, and Lukua. So, it really is possible for humans and dragons to coexist, don't you think? And another example of that same thing is the Kamikat part of this episode. I was gonna say that Fafnir might have become a Magaka? Nope, no real curse books. So affected they, they basically had to censor it. Wait a minute. These three over here. Like, Toru sees that they are not just regular humans, but monsters from her own world, but... Something about them oddly reminds me of the three neighbors that Kobayashi has. The ones that got introduced in episode 3. Like, am I being crazy here? Then again, they should have recognized Toru since they've seen her before, so... That blue bunny looks like the one Kana got back when she was preparing for school. But yeah, the comic up part of this episode was one of the few moments where Toru can finally spread her wings, both figuratively and literally. Kana is gonna have a field trip soon, so she will need a lunchbox. So obviously they are gonna make an over-the-top competition for who makes the best lunchbox, sets and judges and everything. I am Hamburger. New fire has entered the roaster! Ilma, who apparently is of the opposite faction against Toru, so of course they're gonna have some bad blood between them, but no worries. Some cream bread and heavy car integrate into society and work with Kobayashi will do the job of brainwash uh, converting her and having her join our party. I do have to ask, apparently she is not strong enough to create a portal between roads, but rather she used Toru's own portal to come to this road, but... Toru came to the human world like months ago. What the hell did Elma do all this time? Of course, now that Elma is being introduced into the story, Toru is back to being the jealous type again, like how she was with Takia before. All this leads to a little bit of Kobayashi characterization, where she... she ain't the most social, and human relationships are hard for someone like her, so... of course, she wouldn't understand what to do in certain situations. Partly the reason why Toru's jealousy has gotten much worse in this section to begin with. A little bit of praise for Toru, a little bit of head pat, and it is enough reassurance for her. Ah, this is some nice tea. I have also put some poison in it to balance the cuteness overload in my system because of this first section of the episode where Kana asks Kobayashi to go to the sports festival with her since Kana sees her as a mother, but cannot go because of work. This also includes a little bit of characterization for Kana since she has done pranks on her dragon parents to get their attention but instead got banished because of it. So this time, Kana sees how hardworking Kobayashi is at her job, so she decides to let it go for her sake. But surprise, surprise! Kobayashi decides to work overtime so that she can have a day off and be there for Kana at the festival. Probably my favorite Kana story thus far. And then there's the sports festival itself. It was fun. And the last section with the baton race was surprisingly adorable and heartwarming. I mean, there isn't a single shred of doubt that Riko cares a lot about Kana, and seeing her mess up mid-race and her reaction to what would happen if she disappoints Kana, it's like... <sighs> like, the first part with Kobayashi managing to go to the sports festival for Kana, it is still my favorite part in this episode. But this final race was definitely my favorite interaction between Kana and Riko by far. Also, booba 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 booba. Ah, the Christmas episode. Toru has been entrusted by one of the shopkeepers in the district to do a Christmas Eve show for the old people. And it has been decided on the little match girl play, with Kana playing the main role of the match girl. And also, Kana asks if Santa would be able to come if there is no chimney in the house. So, Toru makes a chimney for her, Christmas socks included. Well, eventually, the group realizes that it may become a little boring trying to find new ideas to spice up the play, and came to the conclusion of, fuck it, let's combine everything. The little match girl and the old man selling hats being visited by a sorcerer who makes Kana and Shota into magical girls. Also add in a curvaceous magical fairy. 
the fan favorite for the old people, no doubt, who fights against the Dark Sorcerer and add in a little 47 Ronin plot in it in Magic 2. Yep, I'd have to say that this particular episode was my favorite in terms of having every major character involved in it together. The after party, Kobayashi and Toto flying together and exchanging their gifts, and Kobayashi trying to sneak in and put Kana's present near her without being found, which fails miserably. Like, the entirety of this episode was chef's kiss. Mwah. Kobayashi and the gang win a Katatsu. Man, you don't even need the New Year Festival. You could just have like entire episodes filled with Kobayashi, Toru, and Kana like relaxing on the Kotato and talk about random stuff. And I'd be satisfied. For example, I knew the Chinese Zodiac, but I never heard of this interpretation of how the order of the animals is based on race they did to reach God on the first morning of the New Year. That is the first time that I'm hearing this, so that's nice. With that being said, yeah, the dragon being behind animals like the tiger and rabbit, I call it bullshit too. I, I mean, it should be first. You guys remember that episode of Powerpuff Girls where it was raining all day so they had no choice but to stay in their room and find creative ways to have fun together? I kinda want that too with Kobayashi, the dragons and the Kotatsu here. But alas, we have the festival, and we have the girls all prepared with their kimonos ready. Very nice. Black Maria, the heck are you doing here? Wait a minute. Okay, this has been hinted at before, but what the heck did Lukoa do? Alright, the festival and the countdown for the new year was really sweet. Now go back to being Kotato Works. The topic of families is being revisited here at the end, and you know, it is at this point that I'm starting to think that the parents of Toru are gonna end up being important in the future. And no doubt we're gonna see some more of that conflict between them and Toro when it comes to living with humans, but that will be for a different day. Toru is tasked with making omurais for Kobayashi tonight. Which, by the way, I like the running gag of how Kobayashi tells Toru to make good ones, please. And every time Toru thinks of that moment in her head, Kobayashi gets hotter and hotter when she says that line. Toru thought the normal ingredients were no good, so she decides on using ingredients like from her own road. Also, surprise surprise, we're actually getting to see Kobayashi in Toru's first meeting. You know, back when Kobayashi was drunk and decided to take in Toru as a mate. True enough, Kobayashi was the one who saved Toru from that sword by pulling it out. Indeed, it all started from a time when both of them felt alone, and well, the rest is history as we all know. The highlight for me in this episode is definitely this part where, in the past, Toru did meet another human, and it was at this point she questioned about freedom, and how would it be like if she walked away from the whole chaos versus divine war. And so, she asked the human, what would you do if you had freedom? And the human answered, be a maid, to wear cute dresses, smile, and make their master happy. Which, you know, at first glance, yeah, it does make you think that she's basically enslaving herself. But at least it is her choice. So, yeah, go figure. That when Kobayashi and Toru met for the first time, Kobayashi asked her specifically to become her maid. And we all know how much of a diehard fan Kobayashi is of maids in general. Life can be quite magical sometimes. Well, I did say that Toru's parents were gonna be an important plot point in this, and it seems the time has come. Father is in town, and he wants Toru to come back home. Toru's doubts are being brought back here from previous episodes. It all culminates in this final conflict of the season where both Toru and Kobayashi are fighting for their relationship. What can I say? This was a lovely finale, and I think it was done well. Toru had her doubts, and did actually go back with her father, leaving Kobayashi behind, but eventually came back because this is her home with Kobayashi. I mean, think about it. It is because Toru finally took the initiative to stand tall against her father that she came back to Kobayashi to be with her. Otherwise, Kobayashi would have stayed alone and that would have been the end of the story. Toru took the initiative, and as for Kobayashi, I think that this first section where she was left behind was necessary for her to realize how it feels without Toru. 
Because if the episode started with the father coming in and both then both Toru and Kobayashi start fighting the father like right away, it wouldn't have been as strong. Kobayashi being left like this wasn't necessary. So that when Toru comes back and the father tries to get her back again, Kobayashi would be all, no, I will not let you take her away from me again. And well, with a bit of convincing, Toru's father leaves and Toru and Kobayashi are back to being together, reinforcing their relationship all the more. I couldn't be more satisfied with this episode. And that was season 1 of Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. Overall, a lovely experience, a wholesome series. And I think that one of the most important things I want to say about this anime is that this, above all else, was a romance anime. Because at first, it is easy to say that this is a slice of life comedy anime. Human gets a Dragon Maid. Hi, Jinx and Sue! But no, it had comedy, but each episode had something to say when it comes to the relationships that these characters had. Whether we're talking about Kobayashi and Toru as lovers, Kobayashi and Kana as like mother and daughter, Fafnir and Takia as great friends, each episode had taken itself seriously at times. It's not something among the lines of say, Konosuba or Nichijou where you have comedy only episodes. Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid tried to tell a sweet story between the characters while having nice comedic interactions. This was lovely animated. Not just talking about the way it was animated, both in comedic moments and in action packed moments with how fluid the animation was. But the colors as well, I, oh, I love me some vibrant colors. And this anime was jam-packed with colorful characters, both literally and figuratively. Toto was the best, Kana was the best, Kabayashi was the best, Fafnir was cool, Lukoa, she was... Okay, I feel like they did less with Lukoa in this season than the others in the cast. And Elma was nice, maybe we'll get to see some interesting stories with her in the second season or something, cause now she isn't that same boat as Toru where she tries to integrate into society with her job and humans. And especially the food, I mean, I can totally relate. By the way, for those of you who are the Mineko fans, see if you can find the similarities between these characters. Wait a minute? Fafnir was voiced by Daisuke Ono? The same that does Balor? <laughs> but yeah, you know, this was a lovely, this was a lovely, lovely experience, guys. So, thank you guys for watching this video, and, uh, you know, I might actually do more of these in the future. So, let me know. Do you have, like, any recommendations? Do you want me to do uh, the second season of Kobayashi like right away? Do you want me to do some other anime? Like, I don't know, I I have been recommended like quite a few stuff like Kaguya-sama Love is War, I think it was called. I know I want to revisit um, uh, Little Witch Academia. I watched the first two episodes and haven't continued since. And I want to revisit that because those first two episodes were fun. But nonetheless, let me know, leave a comment below, leave a like, and uh, yeah, I'll see you guys uh, next time. Bye!